Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. I'm John Pascarella. And today, we're going to be talking about Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. But before we do that, I want to tell everybody that listens about something that we're going to we're going to do here. You know, we normally open enrollment to online great books about every 8 weeks and uh, we were due to do that, due to do. <laughs> we were due to open enrollment on April 13th. <laughs> Just doesn't seem like a great idea in the face of all this. So what we all had a little meeting and we came up with an idea because we want people to to read we want people to talk about books and talk about things and develop a community. And we've decided that we aren't going to op- open the enrollment on April 13th, but we are going to offer some free seminars, not over our core curriculum. Did you say free? I did. I did. They're going to cost you, though. you got to read because you can't come <laughs> to the seminar and not know what the heck's going on. And it's going to be over some fun stuff. We're going to do three of them. One of them is going to be hosted by Michelle Hawkins of the Music and Ideas podcast that Carl and I do with her. Uh, It's going to be over Orson Scott Card's book, Ender's Game. And then Carl is going to do one over a P.G. Woodhouse book. Uh, Which one? It's a Wooster and Jeeves book. I, yeah, it's going to be Jeeves and Wooster. I have not finalized my choice yet. I'm going to make it free, though. You'll be able to go to the internet and get it. Yeah, it's got to be right, Ho Jeeves, right? Yeah, they all have Jeeves in the title. They all blend in. I just have to pick the one. Yeah. If you're not familiar, Jeeves and Wooster is the funniest writing in the English language, and there's absolutely no point to it. It's just funny and happy, and I love it. So there's that one, and then our John Pascarella, who's with us today, and he hosts seminars with us. He's going to lead one on Walker Percy's uh, Loss of the Creature. We've done a podcast episode about that show, or about that show, about that essay, and it's kind of a foundational document for what we do. And I think it's uh, mighty important. And you'll come to love John. So here's how you get in on this. You go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash plague. And then you give us your name and your email address. And you select which one of these books. There's a little drop down on there. And you select which one of these books that you're interested in doing the seminar on. And uh, we'll email you. Uh, a link to the book. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to give you electronic copies. These it won't cost you a penny. And uh, also the start times. I think that these seminars are going to be probably the third week of May. So you go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash plague <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, read along with us. We just want people to read and talk about books and learn how to do seminar, learn how to do dialectic and talk about important things. This is, uh, what's the date today? It's all blending together. It's, uh, it's April 2nd. The 2nd of April. Well, everything that everyone on my social media is talking about is something called Tiger King. I have no <laughs> idea what it right. is. Because we got rid of our Netflix a while back, which was a very good decision. You, do you want to spend all of your quarantine time catching up on Tiger King and and whatever else the next craze is? Or do you want to read Ender's Game or... Woodhouse, Cheese and Wooster, the greatest. I, it, I'm a big fan, that big fan of that. Uh, or get into Walker Percy. It's not going to cost you anything. No. Well, so. except your time. You got to read and you got to do it. But it, it'll be great fun. Uh, you'll get to meet some other people that are interested in the same kind of things that you are interested in. And uh, you'll get to spend some time with Uncle Carl or Aunt Michelle or Uncle John. And that ain't a bad thing either. I suspect. I suspect, gents, that we are going to fill up more than one uh, each of these sessions. Um, and I know that Maliki Walsh had expressed interest in uh, hosting some of these seminars as well. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash plague. Michelle won't approve of that. And uh, it's on a... <laughs> in the campaign. <laughs> We're hoping. Uh, Carl <laughs> twisted my... T- this is what Carl does to me, John. I'm like, uh, let's read Arthur Schopenhauer's essay. It's 21 pages. Yeah, great. And he says, for next week, let's read 400 pages of detailed Regency-era dialogue. (laughs) 
from Jane Austen for our show a week from today. I'm like, all right. So we're reading, we read Pride and Prejudice, and uh, this is something I had invo- avoided my entire life. Since 1974, I had tried to not read this damn book. <laughs> <laughs> Who hurt you, Scott? <laughs> the Bronte sisters. Everyone conflates them. No, they're not the same. You're they're right. not the same. But I liked it. I liked it very, very much. So there's a quote I've heard attributed to Mark Twain about Jane Austen that uh, she's the author without which any library can be complete. I just disagree. But there is a problem with Jane Austen, okay, is that she's been adopted by a certain sort of person, a certain sort of coffee club, generally women. Am I allowed to generalize like that? Sure. Sure, but they just thrill at these books and then sit around and I, I think I think actually missed the point. And there's a whole bunch of adaptations, uh, Jane Austen Book Club, all sorts of things. It, if you are a burly, bearded, masculine sort out there, I'm telling you, this is the book for you. That's a good book. So this was my second to last semester in my undergraduate great books program where we read Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. But before that, we did Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women. And I complained that Mary Wollstonecraft was too wooden, that she loved reason too much and didn't understand desire. And some of my peers in the class, particularly those who identified as feminists, looked at me and said, you know, how dare you challenge Mary Wollstonecraft? Do you realize what she did? And yet when we reached Pride and Prejudice, these same women were all swooning over Mr. Darcy and the love story. And I looked at them and I told them, you cannot have it both (laughs) ways. And more importantly than that, I think I agree exactly with what Carl said. Yes, Jane Austen writes love stories, but there is so much more going on there. Uh, And in fact, I think Jane Austen, as well as she understands women, she also understands men very well. She's a person of reason. And so if you're a reasonable person, she understands you. I had a conversation with my daughter today, as I do, my oldest. Did you name that one after Miss Barrett in this book? Which one? Did, Elizabeth. No, no, no. Okay. It's after St. Elizabeth, the okay. mother of John the Baptist. You might have heard of her. I like my idea better. but <laughs> not, not consciously about Pride and Prejudice, but she said something like, you know, something about all these silly romance novels like Pride and Prejudice. And I said, no, there's no silly romance. And she was joking, but the only one who is, there's no romance in this book except Lydia, which we'll talk about it. The, everyone else, well, the good characters are extremely sensible and passion comes in, but it's not driven by passion. So maybe we should talk about, if you haven't read it yet, maybe we should summarize. Uh, there's a guy, Mr. Bennett. I forget his first name. He's married to the very silly Mrs. Bennett. He has five daughters. And uh, he needs to get them married and produce a male heir or they're all going to lose their property because it is entailed away from the female line to a male line. And I figured that Scott Hambrick would look this up, so I didn't need to. Did you look up entailment? I did not. (gasps) I'm shocked. I did Uh, not. But uh, apparently, there, because he had no daughters, they're all going to lose the house as soon as he dies. We actually read a little bit about entailment when we read the Magna Carta not too long ago. I mean, it, it's exactly what you think it is. There's primogeniture, and if there's no firstborn son, it goes outside that household, and then that goes to the ridiculous, awful, disgusting, degenerate Mr. Collins. He's not degenerate. Yeah, yes. I'm going to go to bat for Mr. Collins later. He's just a silly man. He's a small man. And I say that with my mighty condescension, which he would appreciate. <laughs> uh, so there's a bunch of characters. Of the five daughters, there is uh, Jane, who is practically perfect in every way, almost too perfect. There is Elizabeth, everybody's favorite. But on my last reading, I thought, you know, she's a little bit vicious. And we can talk about that. Uh, then there's Lydia, who is totally silly and stupid uh kitty who i don't remember anything distinguishing distinguishing about her and mary who utters pious aphorisms all the time at inappropriate times it'd be like somebody coming up to job on the dung heap and saying there there joe job all will be well 
<laughs> That's yeah. Mary. If this book was uh, written in 2020, uh, Lydia would be an Instagram e thought. Yes. No question about it. Kitty's sort of on the fence. And she needs somebody to set good examples and show her a different way. And so Jane, I think Jane and Elizabeth do that, and then Kitty is redeemed. But Mary, Mary's really doesn't seem interested in marriage and all of these other things. She wants to practice her uh, pianoforte. She wants to read her books. She retires upstairs to her chambers all the time. And she just shows us somebody that just isn't playing the game at all. Lydia's flighty and uh, impetuous and frankly, dumb. And then Mary's the opposite of that. She doesn't, she's, there's no fancy in her. Um, like how, I don't see any way that she would be attracted to any of these, any of these characters, any of these men. Uh, Mary's like Mr. Bennett without the charm. Huh. And if I remember, uh, Elizabeth points this out that Kitty will follow the lead of Lydia. And that's why it was so important that Lydia be reined in. But she blames her parents for not doing that. All right, so let's maybe we should back up a little bit. Now, what the drama in this story is that these girls need to get married. That marriage is the way to the, a good life, to security. There's a lot of reflection on marriage. We could talk about Charlotte Lucas, who ends up marrying the very silly Mr. Collins. But the, the first line is wonderful. It's one of the famous first lines in literature. It's like, call me Ishmael. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. It's a little bit ironic, a little bit funny. You know, if a rich man shows up in town, he's besieged by, well, not the girls themselves, but by the parents of the girls in the town who need to get married. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Mr. Bingley is the wealthy young man <laughs> who comes into town maybe to go hunting. I forget the exact reason, but he shows up in town and just people knocking on his door. <laughs> New meat. <laughs> New meat. Was it like that when you moved to Utah, John? In my experience, no. Uh, but it might've been because I just showed up and I was holding a rosary in my hand. And so the locals <laughs> got scared away. <laughs> but uh, I guess the, you know what? I realized this is not a good example. I'm an academic. And I don't have a good fortune. I don't have the property that would attract other people. Yeah, if you were the landed gentry showing up in Utah, yes. they would be flocking to your door. And so <laughs> I found interesting at the beginning, Mr. Bennett is a frustrating character to me. I love him. I think he's hilarious. I think he's evil. Really? Yes. I think he's the villain. And he's a, he's all the worse of a villain because he's charming. Hmm. Tell me more. Well, you hear his little witticisms, his little funny things, and you chuckle. And But what does he do his entire life? He punts. He retreats to the library. Yeah. Okay? He retreats to the library and does not take part in the raising of his children. <sighs> I don't know about that. You know, he's constantly taking at least Elizabeth aside and having these conversa important conversations with her and, and takes her counsel. Yeah. And uh, he also gives her some counsel when it comes down to the end of the book and uh, everything's getting ready to tidy up there at the end. But he is the anti-Elizabeth for sure. His wife, Mrs. Bennett, was an attractive but maybe empty or vapid person. And um, he married her. She had few prospects, but he married her because of a, some sort of an initial attraction. And found out she was a moron. And found out she was an absolute idiot. She's embarrassing. She's completely deaf to the feelings and goings on and of the other's minds. She's not even, she doesn't even know that other people have minds. She's an NPC. <laughs> <laughs> and then they proceed to have five kids and he's hoping, he's hoping for this male heir and doesn't get one. And then after the fifth child, they try for a number of years and, and are not able to have another kid. And he's stuck with this dingbat. This is the background that Elizabeth carries in her mind apparently she doesn't say this out loud or does it's not written explicitly but i think that this is the thing she's most worried about she is looking for a rational and material fulfillment from her romantic entanglements yeah i want to give a, a little sample here flavor of jane austen when you read these books there's not a lot of action there's very few explosions 
no nothing happens. It's like Seinfeld. Nothing happens. There's nothing in here about <laughs> folkways. There's nothing in here about technology. There's nothing in here about there, – there's nothing in this book but the interpersonal. Yeah, yeah. So it's all in the character. And Austin, as a writer, is very good at giving you character sketches. And I remember the reason we have John here, I think, <laughs> is we were chatting about it. John is an Aristotle scholar. I am. Aristotle writes about virtues and character. And I remember years and years ago, I had a, a professor teaching a class and he just loved Jane Austen. And he said, it's all about Aristotelian virtues. That what's most important is not what the people do, but what their character is. The underlying character that makes them do what they do. Uh, and we'll see that when we get to Darcy, that his actions seem to be of one sort and really are of another sort because she didn't know his character. But I want to just read the description of of Mrs. Bennet. This is the end of chapter one. Her mind was less difficult to develop. She was a woman of mean understanding, little information, and uncertain temper. When she was discontented, she fancied herself nervous. The business of her life was to get her daughters married. Its solace was visiting and news. Boom. There you go. You know, three lines, four lines, and you have Mrs. Bennett. Yeah. She always, always talks about her nerves, but it's not really nerves. She's just upset. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How many people do you yep. hear say, I'm so stressed out? What, what does that mean? It means they're sad. It means they're discontented. Yeah, there's some confusion in them or something that they can't they can't quite place the source of it. And they, there's a burr under their saddle and they can't find it. And the husband, he gets his pleasure. He gets no pleasure from his wife's intellect. He gets pleasure from laughing at her. He says somewhere later in the book that isn't, Lizzie, isn't that what other people are for, for us to mock and to laugh at? Yeah, maybe not, Mr. Bennett. On those two points, I'm not quite on the Mr. Bennett villain train, uh, but he is, he is a disappointed man. Because exactly what Scott said, he married Mrs. Bennett for her beauty and realized that wasn't enough. And Scott, you touched on this. Elizabeth later points out seeing the unhappiness between her parents gives her a sense of what she's trying to look for and to avoid. Um, but the, the other thing that's interesting about Mr. Bennett is I was trying to find the quotation, uh, but Jane Austen actually describes him as mm -hmm. a philosopher. So this is just kind of an interesting thing to think about. What is the temperament of a philosopher? And to your point, Carl, there is something that's harsh uh, and perhaps maybe mildly villainous about that character that comes out with the way Mr. Bennett retreats to his study and doesn't deal with his family. Mm -hmm. I'm going to argue with myself now. So I love Socrates, and a lot of the people that come to us and, and read Plato, they end up hating him. Mm-hmm. And one of the big complaints is probably the big complaint is he's always asking questions and being ironic, but he's not taking part in the world. He's retreating. He's not in politics. Mm -hmm. he, he refuses to do any of that. And so there's a way in which Mr. Bennett is similar. He, he says his witty comments, uh, like he's, uh, uh, he tells, he pretends that he's not going to go see the rich young man. There are protocols. This book's so much about protocol. Uh, there are protocols where the father of eligible young women should go to the potential suitor and invite them for dinner, or you, you go call on them. So the, the dad has to break the ice somehow. And Mrs. Ben is like, you've got to go see Bingley. You've got to go see him. And he says he's not going to do it, and then gets up the next morning and goes and does it anyway. But, you know, but Carl, what's Bennett supposed to do? <laughs> like, he can't get divorced. He's not going to murder her. It's like, what's he? I mean, <laughs> so you know, you're a young person. You're you find this uh, Schopenhauerian attraction <laughs> uh, to to uh, who will become Mrs. Bennett, and you marry her. You're, you're in. How how? What's he supposed to do? Uh, what's he supposed to do is not lose interest with his children. He's interest. He, Lizzie's funny. Jane is perfectly good. So he pays attention to Elizabeth because she's funny as well. Uh, and uh, I think the bad influence on her is making her so sarcastic so that she, she's very, mm. she's rude to Darcy. We're going to yeah, meet Darcy in a little bit. I don't 
understand why every all these ladies swoon over him. <laughs> Actually, I do. But we're gonna we'll talk about that here in a minute. Probably has something to do with the movie. <laughs> no, I, well maybe. But before the movie, he's just until the last twenty percent of the book, he's just an empty vessel. He's whatever the reader wants him to be for that time. They even describe his appearance. He's tall. He's handsome. Although not as handsome as Wickham. He's got some bucks, you know, but all you have are the prejudices of Elizabeth to go on. And so, you, you know, he becomes whatever the reader wants him to be if they're not, if they're not careful. Carl, there's a line on page 21 of my book. I don't know what it is. If you, it's in chapter six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 paragraphs in. It starts, that paragraph says, well, said Charlotte, blah, 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 blah. And then she says, it is better, better to know as little as possible of the defects of the person with whom you are to pass your life. <laughs> I pulled the handbrake right there. Yeah. Can I back up a little bit? Do. So that same paragraph. So I'm going to read up to that because I think the context is helpful and it's a glimpse of the Aristotelian side of Austin. And if she were married to him tomorrow, I would think she had as good a chance of happiness as if she were to be studying his character for a 12 month. Happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance. If the dispositions of the parties are ever so well known to each other or ever so similar beforehand, it does not advance their felicity in the least. They always contrive to grow sufficiently unlike afterwards to have their share of vexation. And it is better to know as little as possible of the defects of the person with whom you are to pass your life. Uh, Charlotte, unlike Aristotle, and I think very much unlike what we're going to see with Elizabeth and Darcy, doesn't think that character and happiness go together. Uh, and this is the beginning of book one of the ethics, where Aristotle says, some think fortune, good or bad, is what de decides your happiness. And so here is a character who we're going to see by the supreme silliness of her own actions, by disregarding the importance of character and happiness, is really going to make herself miserable. She's the female Miss, Mr. Bennett. She makes this bad, this weird marriage choice, just like Bennett did. She's actually worse than Bennett, though. Because at least Bennett had a good enough sense to see beauty. There's no sense that Charlotte even thinks Mr. Collins is handsome. She just, she judges her age, which this was a concern at the time. I'm not going to downplay Charlotte's concern. She's older. She's 27. Yeah, she's 27. She's older. She's not sure if she'll have a good prospect for a husband, but she's not moved by anything. She's a pure self-interested actor. It's almost as, as if an economist <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, decided to <laughs> enter the world of Jane yes. Austen. Guys, you should read this. Two thumbs up. But if you're not going to, if you're a lazy turd, I'll go ahead and tell you right now that uh, Mr. Collins is a, a cousin that is set to inherit Mr. Bennett's properties once he dies. And Charlotte Lucas is the ne neighbor girl. She contrives to get hold of Mr. Collins because he's a he's a rector of a little Anglican church, and they they've got a... A predictable income and an easy life. And he has a patroness. He has a patroness, which is disgusting. He... <laughs> How dare you say that about the great Lady Catherine de Berg? I kind of like Lady Catherine de Berg. <laughs> I would have stabbed her a hundred thousand times. <laughs> Don't patronize the patroness, bro. Collins is like an Ayn Rand villain. He's just concerned about the opinions of others. He's a complete second-hander. Huh. He creates nothing of his own. His greatest claim to fame is that he eats dinner with some broad that inherited something from somebody else. That's the best thing he's got <laughs> going for him, and he's super proud of it. And everybody around him is absolutely disgusted by him, and he has no idea of it, including her. De Berg is patroness. She hates him. She hates everybody. She hates herself. <laughs> I'm just, I'm thinking which Ayn Rand character it is. Is it Wesley Mouch? <laughs> Ellsworth Tui. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, he's like, he's almost like a Tui. You know, he's got this, he's just this smarmy, he knows how to play all of the social convention game, but he doesn't know anything else. Well, he's an economic actor, just like Charlotte Lucas. Perhaps yes. they're, they're perfectly matched because Charlotte ends up marrying Mr. Collins. Um, in my mind, I have cast him as Mr. Bean. Yeah, I saw you say that. 
this will probably get me get me in trouble. They probably are very similar, Charlotte and Mr. Collins, in that they are these economic actors. They're these climbers, you know. They just want something for nothing, and you know, whatever. But to me, that is so much more disgusting in the male character than in the female character that I can't hardly stand to read a word about him. Yeah, there's a point in the end where he introduces himself to to Darcy, who is actually, I think, somewhat of a formidable male character. And for me, Darcy, Fitzwilliam Darcy is, well, he's got lots of the Aristotelian virtues. He's liberal. I think he's, well, towards the end, he's magnanimous. He is a great man in the Aristotelian way. And his response to Collins, he's like, he can't be bothered with Collins. You know, he'd just very politely tip his head just a little bit and then moves on. And uh, for Collins, that's like a huge moment. And then Mr. Darcy tipped his hat to me. <laughs> he's a small guy. He's a climber. To show that he's perfectly economic, he, he shows up at the Bennett house when he's introduced. So he's got five daughters. Collins shows up looking for a wife. And at first, he's very impressed with Jane. Jane is beautiful and perfect. Can't think a bad thing about anybody. But then Collins finds out that Jane might have an understanding with Mr. Bingley. And he's fine. Okay. Well, he looks next. around for a moment. There's Elizabeth. And he just moves down the line to the next daughter. That'd there be. was no passion at all. Such a weird character, but a very understandable character because it is. It's so mercenary what he does. And Lizzie sees right through it, uh, which is, speaks well to her ability overall to read people, uh, although we'll see she falters somewhere else. But yeah, I mean, Collins, the way he moves from one woman to the other and then eventually goes to Charlotte. Yeah. It's just a, he's a bad man. He's not a bad man like Wickham is, but Mr. Collins is a bad and silly man. I think the bad man, Wickham is the worst. Collins is bad. I I still think Mr. Bennett is bad. Hmm. Well, because I'm, I have three daughters, two sons. I don't have five daughters. There you are in your library philosophizing while the kids are feral. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be reprehensible if it were, right? If I right. retreated and, and I don't have a silly wife, I married the most unsilly wife I could find. Can confirm. <laughs> I texted Carl the other day. This pandemic stuff was starting to like kick off. And Carl and I always want to like start pouring concrete bunkers. And, you know, Carl and I, I said, uh, what's the most reasonable one among us say? And I was talking about <laughs> the about Mrs. Melissa. Shoot. Yeah. Yeah. She ordered food. But uh, there's a quote from Elizabeth in chapter four that I think gives you a snapshot of her character. She's talking to Jane. Uh, and she says, compliments always take you by surprise and me never. Mm -hmm. So Jane is always, she's perfect and doesn't think she is. And is always surprised when people are impressed with her. And Elizabeth knows all of the games that are being played. And so a compliment never takes her by surprise. So if Collins comes in and compliments the, the furniture in the, the entryway, and, and but Lady Catherine has. Have I told you about Lady Catherine's furniture, which cost five hundred pounds? You know, this is how he talks. Uh, Lizzie would see that and say, "I know exactly what he's going to say." She isn't surprised by the actions of the small people around her. And of course, is she Jane Austen? I don't know. I don't know Jane well enough either. Yeah, yeah I don't either. But she certainly, we can tell from reading the book that she's this keen observer of societal rules and character and dialogue and psychology. And Liz Lizzie seems to have those same sorts of skills. She's tone deaf in one way and she screws up and we'll, we'll read about that, talk about that. But she's also that keen observer. Mary may in fact be Jane. Jane Austen never married. It's bookish. Um, Mr. Collins is a clergyman. Austin's dad was too. She doesn't depict them very favorably, does she? In the book? Not in this novel. There's a, no. I forget which one. My, my, my Austin, Austin file daughter would tell me which one, but there are some positive portrayals of common parish life in the other books. Collins is not representative. Mansfield Park is one where there's a, a clergyman who's a virtuous man. Collins ain't. 
Yeah. By the way, I think this is a detective novel. Oh, do tell. Well, there's a mystery here, right? Like, what is the real Darcy story? You know, she's observing, she's interviewing, she's picking up clues. And then at the end, there's a, there's a sit down and a reveal almost like in an Agatha Christie novel. And it's like a Sherlock Holmes detective novel. It's not a whodunit. It's like, who is this? Like, what is this person actually in a world, in a world, in a world where everything is artifice and everything is convention to find the true character of the person is very, very difficult. And Elizabeth actually has the tools to do that where few do. And she is the Sherlock Holmes of romance. Yeah. And it's difficult, but it's crucial. Yeah. The character tells you what the, I, I see John, John raises his hand Sorry. when he wants to speak. He doesn't talk. He doesn't know good podcast etiquette, which is to butt your way in like a bull. Right. <laughs> and your piece. Go ahead, John. Uh, so I wanted to back up Scott's point about it being a detective novel and character because that passage about Charlotte uh, that we read where she said, happiness is a matter of chance and you should know as little as the defects as possible. Elizabeth's immediate response to that is, I can't believe that you actually think that way. Uh, but it, if you look at volume two, chapter one, uh, and this is two, I'd say about seven paragraphs in this is where uh, elizabeth she's talking with jane after it's revealed that charlotte has decided to marry mr collins and elizabeth says there are few people whom i really love and still fewer whom i think well the more i see of the world the more am i dissatisfied with it and every day confirms my belief in the inconsistency of all human characters and of the little dependence that can be placed on the appearance of either merit or sense i have met with two instances lately one I will not mention. The other is Charlotte's marriage. It is unaccountable. In every view, it is unaccountable. So Elizabeth, as the student of character, is disgusted with the way Charlotte, Charlotte behaves. Yeah. And we actually get a flaw with Jane almost immediately after that, because Jane says to Elizabeth, well, I can't believe you. I can't believe that you think Charlotte is really this way. I just won't believe that of her. And Lizzie says to her, Jane, you always want to see the good in people, but in this respect, you're wrong, right? She says, you shall not, for the sake of one individual, change the meaning of principle and integrity, nor endeavor to persuade yourself or me that selfishness is prudence and insensibility of danger, security for happiness, uh, which is just a great classical argument about virtue, that if it's truly virtue, if it's truly principle, you don't adjust it according to who it suits. Uh, and it's I'll universal. just add yeah. a note here for our readers who read Thucydides, right? This selfishness <laughs> for prudence, insensibility of danger, security for happiness is actually almost word for word the inversion of values that happens in the revolution or civil war in Corsaira. Huh. I wonder what her library was like. Nerd. I bet it was damn good. But yeah, I'm wondering what Austin read. And I'm also thinking, I hope my daughters talk that way to oh. each other. Yeah. Yeah. The whole book is Aristotelian. Elizabeth's sister takes ill. Yeah. Let's move the plot along. She's at the neighbor's house and Elizabeth, and, and, and it just, it's raining and the weather's crappy. And Elizabeth says, I'm going to go check on my sister. And it's like a three mile walk across the hill and dale in the mud and so on. And they're like, well, we don't, we can't spare a carriage to take you. And, you, you know, and we can't spare a horse either because they're in the work in the fields. And she says, I, I'll walk. It's fine. Because she's a Randian hero. <laughs> and she says, which is to say Aristotelian hero, actually. Same, same. I disagree mildly, but I'll hold that off. Well, it's not. They don't map on. The Venn diagrams of the two cover. Okay. Uh, they, they overlap a lot. And everybody's like, Elizabeth's crazy. She's going to mess up her shoes and her petticoats and her dress. And she's going to be a mess when she gets there. And then what will the neighbors think? She'll look like hell. And Mary says... This is just straight out of, this is straight Aristotelian. Mary says, every impulse of feeling should be guided by reason. And in my opinion, exertion should be in proportion to what is required. She's like, this whole thing is just ridiculous. Elizabeth, everything's out of proportion. There's no moderation in this. It's stupid. And then Mary retires to the library, I'm sure. I think Mary's a caricature of Aristotle. I think Aristotle's much more sensible and warmer. Mary is like Kant's reading of Aristotle, where you just suck passion out of it and suck life out of it. Because there is something genuinely admirable about what Lizzie does. Yes. She just she wants to go care for her sister. 
she essentially braves the storm. Yeah. Well, and the house that she's going to is Bingley's house. Yes. And Darcy's there. And the whole thing's an artifice. Uh, Jane's not sick. She's got a cold. She's She's got the sniffles, but she wants to hang out with these dudes and get to know more about the household and get a feel for what's going on and endear herself to the family and et cetera. So I had a, a technological thought reading this. Now that we are on April 2nd of the plague year, we're all isolated in the olden days. Like three miles is a long way. And like when in the end, when Lady Catherine shows up at, at Longbourn, you didn't just call people. You couldn't call people. You could send a letter, which might get there. Or you had to get on your horse or get your carriage and go drive up and they would hear you coming and they'd say, somebody's coming. And all of the social interactions had to be intentional. You couldn't just slide into somebody's DMs. <laughs> In fact, when somebody showed up at your house, they called that calling. Yeah, to call upon someone. We've since kind of perverted that. It's interesting. A little line in here, right at the first paragraph of chapter eight, where Elizabeth talks about the Bingley's indifference to Jane. Well, actually, the, the narrator talks about the Bingley's indifference to Jane. And this tells us something about Elizabeth. I, and I laughed. I lol here. It says, um, their indifference towards Jane, when not immediately before them, restored Elizabeth to the enjoyment of all her original dislike. She enjoyed not liking him. She's snotty. Yeah, she enjoys... Ah, this is the, the, the influence, I think, of her dad. She likes picking people apart. She likes being superior. This is why she is a temptation to the book clubs. You read this and you say, oh, well, I'm Elizabeth. I'm the one that sits outside the group and can see all their foibles. And it, it, I think it's a temptation because it's not the way that you should. It's not the way that should, you should be. There is a, she says, this is in, in chapter 10, she says, I hope I never ridicule what is wise and good. Follies and nonsense, whims and inconsistencies do divert me, I own, and I laugh at them whenever I can. But these, I suppose, are precisely what you, Mr. Darcy, are without. Uh, and a little further, your defect is to hate everybody, she says to Darcy. And yours, he replied with a smile, is willfully to misunderstand them. She likes to see follies. She mm -hmm. likes to see flaws. She enjoys her disappointment with people. I, true confessions, I will confess that I am subject to this temptation as well. For sure. Yeah, me too. Yep. And you have to remind yourself, like, um, I'm going to go a little off topic. When, Since I work in my other jobs as a strength coach, you know, and there's a temptation sometimes when you see people who have let their physical well-being really go to make fun of them, to think ill. And I have to consciously tell myself, and I'm sorry, but I have to consciously tell myself not to do that and to say rather in my mind as I'm going by, I could help you, I could help you, I could help you. Because otherwise it's too easy for me to go into Lizzie Bennett land and, and say, well, look at that person. Which causes all her trouble because she can't believe that Darcy's actually good. Right. I don't think John has that temptation. I think John probably sees the good in everybody. John is a an Aristotelian hero. <laughs> he uh, applies the the rule and measure to them and sees them as they are. He takes in all the sense data. He integrates it into a concept, a person, <laughs> knows their character fully, and then acts appropriately according to their virtues in his own. Oh, yeah. If only I were that good. Yeah, I'm not. Certainly not now with the pandemic on my brain. My judgment has been compromised. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, Carl keeps telling me to read these giant books. I want to read a, one. I want to read one sentence of this damn book so that you guys who are too lazy to read it know what Carl has done to me. <laughs> this is from chapter 15. When the, the two older girls go and see their aunt, Mrs. Phillips which is their mother, their daffy mother's sister. 
Miss Phillips was always glad to see her nieces, and the two eldest from the recent absence were particularly welcome, and she was eagerly expressing her surprise at their sudden return home, which, as their own carriage had not fetched them, she should have known nothing about if she had not happened to see her Mr. Jones shop boy in the street who had told her that they were not to send any more draughts to Netherfield because the Mrs. Bennetts, the Miss Bennetts, were come away when her civility was claimed towards Mr. Collins by James' introduction of him. One sentence. 400 pages of that. <laughs> Is it too hard for you? No, it's well It's well done. Uh, there's not a spare word in it. Seriously, there's not. There's not a spare word in it. She expects you to be up to the task, and it's doable. It's English, but it's 200 years old. She is a learned creature and thinks nothing of writing a sentence with 11 T commas. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that myself. The the style, um, I was up late refinishing it. I've probably read it six or seven times, but I, I was up till the wee hours of the morning. I think we have probably had, a de- certainly had a degeneration of our language. Everything gets shorter. Everything gets simpler. Yeah. Is Hemingway a genius or was he like mildly retarded? Um, that, those are the only two answers. <laughs> then I have to go with genius. <laughs> the old man with the C plus in grammar. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about Hemingway. John Cougar Mellencamp. He was born in a small town. He writes these simple little songs, and, every, and, they're, and they're great. But can he do other? Like, is it a stylistic choice for that guy to write a little ditty about Jack and Diane? Well, in order to manage a sentence like the one you just read, it's kind of like Cicero. When you take some time when you're in high school and, and do Latin, you have to read Cicero, second or third year. Third year, I think, for me. And it's like the verb is at the very end. So you don't know what the meaning of the entire sentence is until you get to the very last word. And so you're throwing balls in the air and you're juggling three balls and then four and then five and then eight and then 12. And you don't know what it is until you catch them all. And you have to have a mind that is agile enough to keep the indeterminacy till you get to the end. And you can have these wonderful sentences, which probably express the thought process of Mrs. Phillips. But uh, you have to be able to do it, and it takes practice, and it takes having done it. And I, I think we, you know, we're doing text messages. You know, LOL, where are you? Where it's written, are you? Hmm. Our, ours is very compressed, and I think it's less good, frankly. Well, I, I had an argument with a friend. Years ago, we were talking about technical writing and writing for business business purposes. I would have to write documentation for softwares and stuff that we made. And he was saying, uh, you know, you need to write these things, you know, on an eighth grade level. Okay, I get it. But there are concepts and there are nuances that cannot be communicated and understood by eighth graders. Yeah. There's stuff that's more colored and more lovely than uh, 13 year olds can get their head around. That's just not fair to us. And there is beauty that you cannot experience if you're not yeah. prepared to stretch a bit on the language. This novel yeah. might be inaccessible to you. It shouldn't be, though. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so I actually just want to add some text to this point uh, because a lot of the drama of this novel is in, unfolds in letters. Uh, but if you go to chapter 10 in the beginning, we actually have an exchange. Uh, I think this is between Mr. Darcy and it's one of the Bingleys, if I remember correctly. Uh, but early on in that chapter, uh, he's, so Darcy is writing a letter to his younger sister. Describing his letters, he says, they're generally long, but whether always charming, it is not for me to determine. And I think this is Caroline responding, is a rule with me that a person who can write a long letter with ease cannot write ill. Uh, that will not do for a compliment to Darcy, Caroline, cried her brother. So that's this is Bingley now talking. Because he does not write with ease. He studies too much for words of four syllables. Do you? Do not you, Darcy? My style of writing is very different from yours. Right. So we get a sense of the characters between the two. Uh, and oh, cried Miss Bingley, Charles writes in the most careless way imaginable. He leaves out half his words and blots the rest. And Bingley says, my ideas flow, flow so rapidly that I have not the time to express them. 
by which means my letters sometimes convey no ideas at all to my correspondence. <laughs> Your humility, Mr. Bingley, said Elizabeth, must disarm reproof. And then this is Mr. Darcy. Nothing is more deceitful than the appearance of humility. It is often only carelessness of opinion and sometimes an indirect boast. Oh, keep going, though. It's an indirect boast. He's really yeah. cutting his friend. His friend is saying, well, I don't care what I say. You know, it's like uh, Violet Bix from Scott's favorite movie. What, this old thing? I only wear it when I don't care how I look. That, that's what Bingley's doing here. He, he's making his vices into a virtue. And, and uh, two paragraphs later, Darcy, who is also perfectly observant, the indirect boast, you are, for you are really proud of your defects in writing because you consider them as proceeding from a rapidity of thought and carelessness of execution, which, if not estimable, you think at least highly interesting. <laughs> see, I thought that was Holmesian. Sure. I love it. I go with that. You see, this is why talking about books with people is a good thing to do. I had never, ever thought about Pride and Prejudice as a Sherlock Holmes mystery, and now I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're taking these clues from one arena of life and then making determinations about all the other arenas of that person's life, which is, you know, their general character. Yeah, that's deduction, man. It's awesome. Well, we just established the plot. So they have a they have a ball at Netherfield. Darcy appears to have taken some kind of interest in Elizabeth. They keep having little chats together. Um he remarks to his sister that she has fine eyes. Yeah lively witty eyes i think you know instead of talking about her chesticles or ankle or you know whatever you know it's the eyes you know i think that's uh i think that's an early early hint that he has some awareness of her intellect of her mind well he's surrounded by silly people just like mr bennett is yeah fawning um, silly people climbers you know he's the he's the wealthiest person in this book yeah all the ladies do love him well, actually, they don't love him, but they're but they're interested in what he might provide them. I'm kind of fond of him. <laughs> but you become fond of him because of what happens in the book. There's no reason to be fond of him until well at past half of the book. Well, he's a great man. But it's not revealed to us until you're 220 pages in. Sure, it's not unfolded, but there, there's hints of it. I mean, Bingley is silly. Everyone else is silly. Darcy holds himself aloof but is it because he's is it because he's a jerk or is it because he's just mysterious he's better than they are i agree john that he is a great great man but until you're three quarters of the way through he is but a mysterious man in some ways i so i think because uh, carl mentioned this earlier uh, the virtue of magnanimity that darcy embodies he is the magnanimous or the great souled man uh, but in aristotle that's a double-edged sword I, uh, he's admirable all the way through because he is a man who knows his worth. Uh, but there's a harsh side to it. Although even in Aristotle's ethics, he said uh, the magnanimous man is incapable of leading his life for anyone except for a friend. And that's the one thing that's important that you know all the way through is that Darcy genuinely cares about Bingley and <laughs> wants what is good for his friend, although he judges incorrectly in some ways. Uh, he makes the right assessment of the Bennets, but hmm. he's too harsh. Uh, so in that sense, even though he does a lot of really good, noteworthy things at the end, I think for those who are in the know, as you're working through the novel, you can see that he's genuinely a good man, yeah, especially yeah. compared to those around him. Yeah, Bingley is the brother he never had, and then Wickham is the brother he never had, and so they're it's interesting how he treats those two characters. They're in opposition in their care. Yeah. Those two characters are in opposition in their character. And then uh, Darcy's treatment of them shows his magnanimous nature. Carl, I wanted to read one of these funny Mr. Bennett lines. Go. This vapid, shitty Mr. Collins <laughs> proposes marriage to Elizabeth. And she comes to her father and says, uh, and tells him about it. And Mr. Bennett says, an unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Her mom's all in favor of it, guys, because she's a dunce. Mr. Bennett says, your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I will never see you again if you do. <laughs> awesome. I love that. It's a great line. It's so funny. Which chapter is that in? Uh, chapter 20. 
<laughs> in my book. Carl hates him so much. I can see it in his face. Why did he wait so long? This this vulture is prowling around his family, eating his food. And Bennett's off in the library, ignoring him until he <sighs> makes the proposal. What if she said yes? Well, I have the same concerns, but it's it's almost cultural. It would be an outrage to throw somebody out of your house. There are a number of people in this book that I would have beat the shit out of. <laughs> <laughs> really i would have whipped his ass and thrown him out de Berg, i would have slapped her and thrown her out the window like there's a number of people in here that you know straight talking emersonian american people would not mess with nobody says what they want there is almost there's the only direct speech in this book comes from Elizabeth and then Darcy at the end. It's all innuendo. It's all reading between the lines. It is absolute theater. This is what I thought the book would be, would be nothing but this sort of uh, costume drama. And this is my prejudice, which was no good and was false. But I thought it was just going to be this costume drama and this just, uh, just this study in Regency era manner and affect. And it's all in there, but it's actually, I think, a critique of it. And any good that's gotten from the culture is in spite of that. And just over and over again, I'm like, just say the damn thing of every character. Just say it. Well, there's a lot at risk. So all the more reason to say it. Yeah. But if you're navigating the waters and you, you, you misstep, then you're out of luck. Like Darcy says somewhere, my good opinion once lost is irrecoverable or something like that. And Wickham does this. So we haven't talked about who Wickham is. Wickham was a young man raised with Darcy in the house. Is the the son of the steward of the house? Yes. So is he Faramir? <laughs> no, that's a Lord of the Rings joke. Oh my gosh. Oh. That's the nerdiest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> He's not of good character. Uh, he is not self-controlled. He has gambling debts. He is always asking for money. He uses his charm. He's very charming and handsome. Uh, and there's a line where uh, I think it's Jane. This is in chapter 17. It was not in her nature to question the veracity of a young man of such amiable appearance as Wickham. Or that might've been Lizzie actually thinking that he's, he's real good looking and he knows how to, uh, talk to women in a way that makes them feel loved at the very end of the book after mr bennett has another good line where he says there he goes simpering and fawning he makes love to us all you know, yes yeah. that's what wickham does and he's a bad character you know and i'm wondering if he went wrong once and now he's known to be a bad character and it goes around to all of his social circles what way out does he have the Navy. Yeah. He's not even good enough character for that, but that would have been the way. Yeah. So, I, I mean, there are a couple of things on this one, just to the, the badness of Wickham's character. I believe Darcy has one of the cutting lines about Wickham is that uh, Mr. Wickham has the manners that allow him to make friends easily. Whether or not he's able to keep them is a different story. Uh, and to, to Scott's point about the military being a refuge for Wickham, this is actually, this is the last line of persuasion. Uh, so I'm spoiling the end of this book, uh, but Jane Austen praises, because it's Captain Wentworth, uh, Jane Austen praises the effect that the military could have on shaping the character of a man. But for Wickham, it's a different story. In chapter 16, uh, this is, how far into the chapter is it? I'd say maybe 10 paragraphs in, where Mr. Wickham talks about why he's a member of the military. And he says, it was the prospect of constant society and good society, which was my chief inducement to enter the Shire Militia. I knew it to be a most respectable, agreeable corpse, and my friend Denny tempted me farther by his account of their present quarters, and had the very great attentions and excellent acquaintance of Meryton had procured him. Society, I own, is necessary to me. I have been a disappointed man, and my spirits mm. will not bear solitude. I must have enjoyment in society. A military life is not what I was intended for, but circumstances have now made it eligible. The church ought to have been my profession. I was brought up for the church, and I should at this time have been in possession of a most valuable living, had it pleased the gentleman we were speaking of just now, right, that being Darcy. Mr. Darcy's father. But uh, this is actually, it's a line where, again, uh, if you know Aristotle, this is a clue. 
uh, in book nine of the ethics, Aristotle talks about the wicked man. And he says, the wicked man constantly flees to the company of others because spending time with himself makes him miserable. He only dwells on his bad deeds. I mean, again, almost word for word, Austin puts this in Wickham's mouth, but he's an appealing and engaging character and he flocks to society because in an odd way, it allows him to hide his defects. He always leaves as soon as he could be found out. He's the incontinent from Aristotle embodied, I think. I actually think he's worse because the, the person who's incontinent or lacks self-restraint knows what the good is, but doesn't choose it. I think Wickham is a vicious man. He Thank chooses you. vice. Okay. Yeah. He seems to. Yeah, you're right. But he's charming as hell. You'd run him out of town. Uh, Mr. Darcy's father, the elder Mr. Darcy, had a beloved man in his employ, Wickham. And Wickham's son uh, was kind of taken on as a ward by Darcy's father. And Darcy's father in his will said, hey, take care of this guy if you can, essentially. And the guy was a scoundrel. Uh, he tried to elope with uh, Darcy's sister, perpetrated a dozen misdeeds and deceptions, and Darcy uh, said, here's some cash. Don't let the door hit you in the rump. And then he continues to come back into Darcy's circle and ultimately deceives Elizabeth as to Darcy's, Mr. Darcy's character and, uh, and claims that Darcy had deprived him of his rightful inheritance from the elder Mr. Darcy. And uh, later marries the superbly stupid Lydia uh, after uh, crossing state lines with her uh, and <laughs> For immoral so on, purposes. and a manhunt and so on. Yeah, and I think that's Mr. Bennett's best moment is when he, he runs off to try to find her. He can't find her, but his wife is worried that he's going to get into a duel with Wickham. She hopes. That bitch hopes that they get in a duel. Could, don't you think? She hopes that her husband would show that amount of passion about the children at last. Every line I read with her bringing this up, that he's going to get in a fight, he's going to get in a duel, oh, he's going to get killed in a over this daughter's honor. Gosh, she, she would love that. She would forever be the widow of a man who died defending the honor of the family. She would, the, she would love nothing more. That might be so. I, I still like him I for hate her so much. <laughs> I like him for dropping everything. And that, that's when he starts to be a father to the three children that d didn't interest him. Yeah. And his words yeah. to Kitty later on is like, Kitty, you're never getting out. Maybe in 10 years, if you can pr show me that you've been rational for 10 minutes a day, we might let you out. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> 10 minutes a day. Man, yeah. if I could be rational 10 minutes a day, I'd be pretty happy with it. So we, we're kind of skipping around. So Darcy has been, through this whole time, enamored with Elizabeth, only he knows he shouldn't be. She has no property. Her mother's a dunceoid, and the sisters ain't so much. Mr. Bennett is not wonderful. He's met the Phillipses, and uh, not so much on that. Like, her family will not bring esteem to his house. And uh, they, they talk in here all the time about someone's breeding. Oh, he's well-bred. They don't uh -huh. mean breeding. They actually mean somebody's manners that they were taught. Right. And, and, uh, and her breeding is not good. And she's uppity. She's mouthy. She's a problem. <laughs> Who, Elizabeth? Yeah. She is. She is. She's uh, sharp-tongued. She mm -hmm. doesn't play the game as much as everyone else. She's sarcastic, which I think are show her her intelligence which is what i think darcy's actually attracted to although well, she's described as being pretty too but not as pretty as jane and that's so unique in her like it's a breath of fresh air everybody fawns in front of mr darcy and he's got this giant estate pemberley and he has an income of ten thousand a year and all of this stuff and everybody's just ass kissing constantly right and she's and she right. doesn't and he's just like what like <laughs> what's happening here like the mystery of like I can imagine, it's not really said in the book, but I can imagine that for a man who's treated in one way by every acquaintance they come up to, to suddenly have a, a chick that's an eight act in a completely different way would be just mesmerizing. Good Did you say she was an eight? She's probably an eight. Jane's a 10. <laughs> this is early on in chapter six of volume one where we actually get a hint of what Darcy's thinking. 
trying to figure out this if this again is immediately after the Charlotte Lucas conversation. Uh, and he says, uh, let's see, how does Jane write it? Uh, occupied in observing Mr. Bingley's attentions to her sister, Elizabeth was far from suspecting that she was herself becoming an object of some interest in the eyes of his friend. Mr. Darcy had at first scarcely allowed her to be pretty. He had looked at her without admiration at the ball, and when they next met, he looked at her only to criticize. But no sooner had he made it clear to himself and his friends that she had hardly a good feature in her face than he began to find it was rendered uncommonly intelligent by the beautiful expression of her dark eyes. To this discovery succeeded some others equally mortifying. Though he had detected with a critical eye more than one failure of perfect symmetry in her form, <laughs> he was forced to acknowledge her figure to be light and pleasing. And in spite of his asserting that her manners were not those of the fashionable world, he was caught by their easy playfulness. Of this she was perfectly unaware. To her he was the only man who made himself agreeable nowhere and who had not thought her handsome enough to dance with. <laughs> There's no better prose than that and characterization. It's wonderful. And so for the first half of this book, he is trying very hard not to fall in love because he knows he shouldn't. Rationally, he shouldn't, at least according to the rules of the society that he's in. Uh, it's an un, it'd be completely unsuitable. It's, I don't know, it's New York elite and hillbilly. Mm -hmm. It would never work. You, know, you, you wouldn't use the right spoon at dinner. Yeah, so what is love for these people in this society? I mean, there's a lot of talk among these girls about love, and they are girls. Listen, like Mary, I think, is the youngest. Um, Lydia's 16. They're, they're somewhere between 14 and 27 years old. I think Jane's the oldest at 27. She's 23. Charlotte Lucas is 27, just a correction. You know, they're 17 and younger, mostly. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about love. In chapter 22, there's a description by the author of Charlotte's relationship here with with Collins. She says, her reflections were in general satisfactory. Mr. Collins, to be sure, was neither sensible nor agreeable. His, so his society was irksome, and his attachment to her must be imaginary. But still he would be her husband. Without thinking highly either of men or of matrimony, marriage had always been her object, Charlotte's. It was the only honorable provision for well-educated young women of small fortune, and however uncertain of giving happiness, must be their pleasantest preservative from want. This preservative she now obtained, and at the age of 27, without having ever been handsome, she felt all the good luck of it. So, you know, this is The Economist, but this is everybody's calculus too, though. Like, it's at least part of it. Elizabeth has no means of providing a living for herself if she doesn't find a husband to do so. They cannot own property. This is Regency-era England, uh, and that's just the way it works uh, without getting any you know, stupid commentary on that. Those were the material conditions. And so it's really interesting to me that these women, these five young women, Bennett women, have to consider this. They're, when their dad dies, there's no more money. They have to consider the economic. Yet, they speak of romance, they speak of attraction, they speak of love. And a, what a squeeze place they're in. And even Darcy's in that place. Because that's the all the reservations about the Bennett's manners and the way they behave. He's got to run through that calculation where the conventions tell him, you have to marry with a certain class of person. And yet the character, which is what he's really judging by, right? It's the character that sees through the conventions, that sees that Elizabeth is the gem amidst all of this. And there's that great move that his character has to make where he eventually realizes yeah, the conventions really aren't built on anything natural, but the character is. And that's why I'm choosing you. That's why I'm going to do these things for you, Elizabeth. Uh, it's just a brilliant setup. So he proposes in uh, yeah. chapter 34. Lots of times Darcy will show up near Elizabeth and just be silent. Yeah. <laughs> He's so awkward. <laughs> he doesn't know what to do. Yeah. At one point he says, I can't remember where it is in the book, but he says, if I have nothing to say, I'll say nothing. He won't make the small talk. He won't exchange the pleasantry. How can you not like him, Scott? Oh, I, well, I like him very much. I like him very much. And he's an introvert in a society where all of the rules are set up for extroversion. Oh, gosh. You extroverts out there. Can I make a plague comment? You extroverts who think that by going up to strangers and talking to them, you're making their lives better? Just stop. Right. 
And now that we flipped it and you have to stay home, this is a taste of your own medicine. Okay. So be more, more sensitive to those of us who would rather just go shopping and not talk to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> just, I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> you know, I love talking to you guys, but with people I don't know in a party, I, I I'm much more Darcy. Not that I'm as rich, but I stand in the corner and drink my beer and listen to everybody else. You know, no I, small talk, only big talk. Yeah, I like big talk very much. Small talk, uh, whatever. He, the way his proposal comes out, after a silence of several minutes, he came towards her in an agitated manner and thus began, in vain have I struggled. It will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. <laughs> and then goes on to explain all the reasons why he shouldn't marry her but he will anyways yeah your family's terrible <laughs> but for him this is why i love it but for him to know all of those things and still have that great care in spite of them for him that was the evidence for him that it had to be acted on you know i think that if he had thought well i care about her a great deal i have this love for her and there's no reason why i shouldn't like how would he have tested that to the same measure you see what i mean there's drama in this because all of this stuff matters. And, and I've already talked to Scott about this. I used to watch a, a YouTube adaptation of this. It's probably still out there. The Lizzie Bennett Diaries set in modern age as if Lizzie's a doing a video of log. And it's kind of, it's kind of clever. And if you're a Jane Austen fan, you, you watch a lot of stuff, but the social conventions are different. Nobody cares if anybody gets married anymore. I'm rounding down. Nobody cares if anybody gets married anymore. There, there isn't this sort of drama in the relationships. It doesn't matter, you know, for Darcy to propose is a big step. There's a lot at stake. There's his connections. There's his fortune. There's, you know, his, he has a young sister. All their happiness. Yeah. All of your happiness is tied up in marriage. And maybe I think wrongly, maybe we don't think that, matters anymore in 2020 but it means we don't have any good love stories there's nothing at stake you know two people meet they do whatever they do there's nothing at stake they break up carl they think there's nothing at stake yeah i mean think about the the honesty of the conversation that unfolds in this moment when darcy proposes and elizabeth rejects him and then darcy has to go and he has sense enough to know that he cannot stay in this moment and explain himself, that he has to write the letter to set it out. But there are no illusions between them. Whereas today, it's all about playing some type of game and not actually showing what you think or pretending you don't think or feel anything significant. But this is, I mean, these are people who realize character matters, that that has to be the foundation of love and marriage. And then everything else, the, the social classes, the money, that's all built on top of it. But they know the stakes. Right. And so she, why does she reject him? Well, she thinks she believes Wickham's stories, and she believes yeah. that he is a prideful, grudgeful man. She thinks he's rude and, and awful. Like she's well, just him up to be And awful. there's some facts. There's some evidence that appears to put him in a very poor light. So Wickham has already, he preemptively struck. Wickham mm -hmm. got to the ladies first, got to Elizabeth, and tells his own story as if Darcy was the bad guy who threw him out of the house uh, and denied him his inheritance. Darcy is a confidential, private, courteous man and will not tell an ill tale of, of even Wickham, who he dislikes greatly. I mean, he, he won't besmirch him to even protect himself until later he eventually has to. Yeah. And the other thing is Jane and Bingley. Uh, what's Char Is it Charles Bingley? Charles Bingley, yep. You read these books, you end up calling everybody Mr. You know, Mr. <laughs> Bingley. Chuck. He was enamored of Jane, but Jane is so reserved that you're not sure that she feels reciprocal feelings. So Darcy extracted Bingley away yeah, from Jane. Took him back to London. So that he wouldn't marry her because he didn't think that she liked him. And, well, we'll find out why, but... Darcy broke up the marriage of her sister, the potential marriage of her sister. And just one note to add here, because it is interesting, early on in the novel, 
Charlotte observes that Jane's manner towards Bingley could be interpreted as cool. So it's not as if Darcy's impression is incorrect. Yeah, the, the truth of it's incorrect, but what he observes fits. Other people can see it. Yeah, she actually says at one point that a woman uh, nine-tenths of the time should explain more affection for the man that is warranted. And, uh, and Jane doesn't do that. Then he writes the letter. I love the letter. Oh, he has such a neat, fine hand. <laughs> so he waits where he knows she's going to show up. They're, they're mad at each other. He says, I, I hope you will do me the honor of reading this letter. And then he ducks out of town. But the letter lays it all out. Uh, it says, the situation of your mother's family, though objectionable, was nothing in comparison to that total want of propriety so frequently, so almost uniformly betrayed by herself, by your three younger sisters, and occasionally even by your father. So he's explaining, I wanted you to marry you. Your family's a disaster. And it really is a disaster. And he le I don't know if this was rhetorically wise of him to lead with that. <laughs> I might have led with the Wickham stuff. But, you know, Elizabeth, your family's really a disaster. Well, this marriage stuff for these people is so much about family, though. It really is. I mean, we read it now and you're like, mm, you know, we should do the compliment sandwich. Yeah, you look great in that dress today. Your mom's an asshole. And I'd sure like to spend more. You know, we don't do that. <laughs> they didn't do that. That The family was so important. Yeah, I was thinking through this. I feel like I wish to Mr. Mr. Hambrick and mm -hmm. Mr. Pascarella. I'm in the Jane Austen mood. I was thinking, Mr. Hambrick, of something you uttered on another podcast, the Barbologic one, about hiring the detective. Oh, yeah. If you, you move to a new town and you meet the girl and everything seems great, but you don't know her family, you don't know her background, and mm -hmm. how seriously you want to take that. But that's very much Jane Austen. You, you need to know the character of this person. Mm -hmm. And however you do it, maybe you, maybe you don't hire a detective. I don't know what you do. Maybe you do. There are Wickhams out there, guys. There are. Yeah, they should have hired one for Wickham. They should have. Uh, John, you were just talking about you know how this is all about character for these people, and how the letter they're act and when, in that moment after the proposal or during the proposal they're ab able to say these things to each other. And you're right, but not everybody has that character. Right. Like I, I, it made me think about like just the whole sort of dating hierarchy. So uh, the Aristotelian hero, Darcy, marries this firebrand of rationality, <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, and then Bingley marries Jane. OK, so we're not, we, we took a step down in terms of, you know, this sort of heroism, blah, 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 all the way down to Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Bennett and Lydia and Wickham. Like, not everybody can do that. There aren't many paragons. What do you do? Virtue's rare. Our frequent motto, and the one I love, the noble things are difficult. You've got to dig. Uh, but, I mean, to get a little biographical, I mean, this is, I, just, I have no time for the frivolous nonsense of most of the dating scene or the shallowness of people. And I've just accepted that I'm not going to play the game. So if that means I have to wait, I'll wait. Yeah. For all you See, there's a romance there. novel right there. Mm. One Mr. Pascarella. <laughs> uh, I got a story to tell. Yes, please. Uh, there's a young man. His name's Will. And he, he listens to the Barbell Logic podcast. And he emailed me a couple of years ago with some questions about dating. <laughs> which was <laughs> fascinating to me. And, uh, and I ended up talking to him on the phone about maybe once a month for almost two years now, a year and a half, two years. And he and I were doing an Instagram live together. He's in a, he's in a, he's a investment advisor. And we were talking about the stock market and things like that. And, and a, and a young woman showed up on the Instagram live following the Instagram live. And he said, hello, Rebecca. And I didn't know who it was. It wasn't a, I didn't know who it was. I said, who's this Rebecca? He said, uh, I went to high school with her. And I said, why aren't you guys married? And she typed in, <laughs> he never asked. <laughs> And, uh, well, by and by, I, I set them up to go out. I was like, you guys need to go out and eat, get a lunch like Monday. Well, on Wednesday they went and got, had lunch and then again on Friday. And then, uh, he called me this morning and he was talking to me about it. He said, you know, we're here in the state we're in lockdown, lockdown, like get a ticket if you go outside, apparently. 
and uh, they live in they live in a rural state in the south and uh and I said well he said it's really hard to date in court in the, these situations and he's 23 and she's 21 or something like that and he's staying with his parents right now because of all of this and I said well if I was you I'd drive back roads like a bootlegger and I'd go get her and I'd bring her back to the house and we'd shelter in place and she'd eat my out of mom's cook, cooking and we'd play cards and we'd either be engaged at the end of the quarantine or we'd be ready to get rid of each other. He said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to call her right now. And he hung up. And that was just before we started the show. Uh, that's awesome. It is awesome because that's what they do in this thing. Uh, somebody will go and stay with their aunt <laughs> <laughs> and then they'll go and take dinner with the other family and everybody. Then dad hunts with the guy. And when they're courting, the whole community is involved in that for that time. And they might only court for three, four, five, six months. And then they get engaged and then they're married. But it's a pretty, in, it seems fast, but it, there's more quality time involved. Well, yeah. And if, if the community is intact, they've been courting their whole life. Or right. pre-courting, right? All these people know each other in this part of England. I didn't look at it on a map, but um, like Lady Catherine de Burge is Darcy's aunt. The the social circles revolve. You're going to know who these people are. You're not going to need to date for 10 years. So Darcy writes a letter and he explains himself well, I had reservation because your family's terrible and they are terrible. And it's going to take Elizabeth a little while to figure this out, that he's absolutely right. Nothing that he says is false. Um, and he explains himself with respect to Wickham, that Wickham has done some bad things. In fact, uh, with the young Darcy, with the sister, had attempted to elope with, what's her name, Georgiana? Yeah. Georgiana yes. Darcy. To get the fortune. And... And he ends it. I love the way he ends it. I shall endeavor to find some opportunity of putting this letter in your hands in the course of the morning. I will only add, God bless you, Fitzwilliam Darcy. He adds that little that little line. That's so he's not mad. I mean he's mad, but he just he has to justify himself. He's like, I don't want to offer you any pain. It's not please marry me anyway. It's here's the truth of the case. Right. God yes. bless you. Have a good life. Georgiana is Mr. Darcy's utterly charming little sister, and her approval of Elizabeth is very important to Darcy, and I think ultimately to Elizabeth as well. Austin mentions in the book that they're in, in Derbyshire. Uh, that's where Mr. Darcy lives, and he mentions Chatsworth, which is a, a house that the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire live in, and they, they're in the sort of the Peak District in the sort of Midlands of England. He said you know, where that was, Carl, in the, on the map. Uh, the Bennett family lives about 50 miles south of there, as best I can tell from this. And I have actually been to Chatsworth House. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And the Duchess of Devonshire, who lived at Chatsworth, her name was Georgiana. Hmm. And there is some astounding art in that house, paintings and statues of Georgiana. Look at this. Wow. That's, that's definitely an eight. This painting is 12 feet tall. It's at the end of a long, long hallway. She's painted as an angel coming out of the, the heavens. Yes. Yeah. This would have been contemporary. I don't know. The little sister has some significance here, I think, that I haven't quite put my finger on. She is not a Bennett girl. Mm -hmm. No. Well, it makes sense because she's <laughs> raised in Pemberley, and by all accounts, Darcy's father was a good man. The education he gave to his son and his daughter was good. And so Darcy and Georgiana know each other very well. They actually know each other's character. Even Georgiana drops the hint that, you know, my brother has been speaking so favorably of you for such a long time, and now I actually get to see the account. Yeah, so what happens is uh, we have to work how the plot works out. Okay. Elizabeth spends some time with Charlotte, meets with Lady Catherine. I like Lady Catherine. She's a... a She's an obstreperous old lady who always says what she thinks and thinks everyone needs to hear it. She's the weakest character in the book. It's just all <laughs> on the nose. She's like a Walt Disney villainess, <laughs> like from like Lady and the Tramp or something. It just sucks. <laughs> I've known people like her. DeBerg. She's got the Norman name. I think it means something. Of course, Darcy was probably at one point had a 
an apostrophe in there. It's maybe a Norman name as well. But yeah. you know, the rest of these people are they're angle stock. But a bunch of stuff happens. The the young daughter goes off to where does she go to Brighton? She goes off and uh, with Colonel Forster and his wife, and yep. there's Wickham, and so bad things happen there. And just note, Lizzie said not to let Lydia go. Right. She goes to her father and says, do not let Lydia go to Brighton. Brighton is still a den of iniquity, by the way. It's a seaside town. There are sailors hanging out there, and the Marines, and all the things that happen in port and seaside towns. It's a resort town. So don't let her go. Of course, Mom had wanted the whole family to go. Mm. And he's like, no, 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 no. And then um, Mr. Bennett lets Lydia and Kitty go. I just think of the pinball wizard song. From Soho down to Brighton, I've played the silver ball. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and Elizabeth ends up, I think it's with the gardeners who her aunt and uncle. Her wonderful aunt and uncle. And yep. they happen to be up in Derbyshire. When I was reading it, I said Derbyshire in my mind. So did I get it wrong? It's Derbyshire. Derbyshire. Sure. I think her uncle says, well, would you like to go see Pemberley? Well, it, will the Lord of the Manor be in? No, no, he's out. Well, okay. And so they go, this is Artifice. You know, it's a great scene in in my favorite movie version of it. They make it a little hotter than it is in the book. <laughs> in the movie, Darcy just got out of the pond. He's so... He's so hot with love, he can't stand it, and he dives. In. This is just in the movie. He dives in the pond, and he gets out, and he takes his shirt off, and he's walking back, and or his shirt's all wet, and, and she sees him. That's not in the book. But he does come home unexpectedly, and so they meet in Pemberley, and acquaintances are renewed, and she gets to see how he lives. She gets to talk to the servant who loves him. My daughter pointed this out. It is the best forested land in the area. And Sarah told me there's some kind of trees that he plants that take a long time to grow, like 50 years. She'd looked this up. I didn't know that she did this. Sometimes your kids are smart and then they, <laughs> they surprise you. Or they go to Brighton. Or they go to Brighton. But there's a joke line later in the book where Elizabeth is asked, when did you start to fall in love with Darcy and she says when I saw the grounds at Pen Pemberley mm -hmm. you know the big fancy house and she says it with a smile and it's not the grounds it's the character but what my daughter pointed out is that the grounds reveal the character yep they are husbandmen yeah he's taking very good care of the land he's he's planting the appropriate stuff it does reveal character your house reveals you I'm I'm looking around at my cluttered den here in the basement and thinking, uh-oh. But the way you keep your, your property, it tells something about Darcy. And so she does begin to think that she might, well, if only he'd asked her again. Yeah, his chief maid, housekeeper, she runs the house. He's not married. I can't remember her name, uh, but trusted employee, and she's been with the family since he was four years old, has nothing but good and fine things to say about Mr. Darcy. And she gives um, Elizabeth a tour of the house. And room after room, Elizabeth's like, this is just so well done. There's nothing extravagant here. It's the best quality. It's the most well thought out uh, home that she had ever been in. It wasn't just... Like she had been to Deberg's house, which was just gaudy and kind of a uh, Trumpian, <laughs> and, and, and it was just it was just sumptuous for sumptuousness' sake, and 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 she saw a sort of restraint and taste in the way the house was put together that had bearing on what she believed Darcy would be as well. Yeah, would not be so bad to be the mistress of Pemberley. Yeah, and Darcy, we were talking about the introversion. This lady de Berg is his aunt. And she's just an awful, just an, <laughs> ah, she's just a t t terrible O'Hara. And, and, uh, you know, I have a way to deal with Lady Catherine de Berg's. I've had some in my life. Mm -hmm. I you have just, to. you just talk back at him. I, I whisper things to him. <laughs> if you, if you kowtow, you know, they don't respect you. Right, You're, the Lady Catherine's in your life. You just have to tell them what's what. Yeah, Ka Lady Catherine's like Elizabeth. Play us a song. Get up and play us a song. And she doesn't want to do that, and because she's not like her sister Mary, she hasn't practiced endlessly, and and she just she's not her. No, she's nobody's dancing monkey. 
And she, she pretty much says as much. And then Darcy smiled and said, you're perfectly right. You've employed your time much better. Elizabeth immediately began playing. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, no one admitted to the privilege of hearing you can think anything wanting. We neither of us perform for strangers. You know, and to tie that to the distinction between Lady Catherine's estate and Darcy's, right, uh, the virtue of magnificence in Aristotle's ethics, right, where it's spending on a grand scale, but Aristotle talks about the way that you adorn your house reflects the magnificent man's character, right? And uh, the vice, the excess of that, forgetting what the English word for it is now, right? Okay, but it, it's ostentatious. Um, and the Greek for that excess is uh, aperokalia, which is the noble or the beautiful without limit, right? And so uh, it, it really is a destruction of the beautiful to be like Lady Catherine, to put all these things on display, to perform for strangers, whereas Darcy the nature of the estate and the nature of the house match the nature of the man. And he, like Elizabeth does not destroy the beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was like high-fiving you virtually. <laughs> Magnificence. That's what Social he Social distance high five. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a, an, a movie adaptation of another Jane Austen novel uh, called Clueless, which is an adaptation of Emma. It's a good adaptation mm -hmm. of Emma. It's, I think that that, is a great movie. I haven't actually seen it. I it's do. funny. I do. I think it's a great movie. <laughs> but she's showing like the columns in front of her house. Her house has fake columns. <laughs> it's like, we have a real classy place, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the opposite of magnificence. We have a house in our neighborhood. I, I don't go out walking much anymore, certainly not now. But there is a house in our neighborhood that has a an enormous fountain statue of a bare-breasted mermaid. This is not magnificent. I expect to see this. <laughs> I expect to see this on Instagram. I'd have to break quarantine and go take a picture. A little less is more. You know, spend your money on beauty. Don't spend it on showy. Right. If you ever get a chance. I, well, you know what? There's a there's a Netflix documentary about this Chatsworth house I was talking about earlier where this Georgiana Duchess of Devonshire lived, which is a Regency era um, house, which Pemberley, which is fictional, might have been based on. I, I don't know, but it's certainly similar. And you'll see that there are some rooms, there's a ballroom there that's that's a little ostentatious, but you'll see the artwork that that family purchased and the, and the, the furnishings there are extraordinary and say a lot about their, frankly, their Anglo rationality. There's a statue in, in their chapel called the flayed man, which is a bronze, but it's uh he's flayed. He has no skin, but it's a, it's a wonderful anatomical study. You know, it's, it's about their art, their art in all, in all, all the furnishment in there is about about their rationality and their value of nature and the world around them and that family wanting to understand and take part in it in a profound way. It's it's an astounding place. The whole time I read this, I was thinking about that. I want to go sideways just for a moment. We've done a podcast on art. That's what all of these are. In the old days, art was paid for by people like Darcy. It wasn't funded by the feds. You worked real hard. You made your money. You know, you established your family. You wanted to live in a beautiful place. And then you hired craftsmen, artists, to make beautiful things for you. And you paid them money and they made a living. You know, like when I went to the Lion and Healy Harp Factory, all the craftsmen making these fantastic harps, they probably couldn't afford them. I mean, they couldn't afford the top of the line, Louis XIV harp, you know, the quarter of a million dollar harp. But that's where beauty comes from. It comes from people of good character using their wealth to support people who make beauty. And Darcy's that way. Apparently his dad was that way. Apparently this Chatworth house is that way. And so and she's just falling in love with him. How can you not, you know? And you, and you learn the truth of Wickham and, and then you start thinking, well, maybe my family is a disaster. And then, of course, when 
she gets the news that Lydia has run off, has eloped with Wickham, has gone off to Scotland. Now she's starting, she absolutely face to face with the fact that her family is kind of messed up. He was right in the letter when he said that. Well, what will happen? Will they get married? It's a Jane Austen novel. It's a well, good bet somebody's getting married. Spoiler, they do. Through the good offices of her aunt and uncle, the gardener, she's able to come in contact with Mr. Darcy again and again, late in the book. In chapter 45, Mrs. Gardener, her Elizabeth's beloved aunt, notices the fireworks between Darcy and Elizabeth. But this is Regency area England. <laughs> Nobody can say anything that's obvious. And, and in this passage here in chapter 45, Mrs. Gardner wants to ask, ask, she wants to ask her a question. She wants to ask her a question, wants to ask her about this. What's going on? I can't help but notice you guys must have known each other and you have a history and what's happening. And Elizabeth also wants to tell her, her favorite aunt about this. Neither of them says a word. This, I, to have lived in this era, I would have drowned myself in the tent. I would have put a stone around my neck and drowned myself. Because everything for these characters, virtually everything, I'm rounding, like Carl says. I'm rounding. Everything for these characters is interior life. Like, where does their interior life ultimately become action, particularly for the ladies in this, in this book? They can't even give voice to their interior life. This is the thing that I thought the book would be entirely about, and this is why I never wanted to read it. I trust Carl so much that I will read <laughs> stuff that I think will be vomit. So far. And he's always right. I wrote down here about this. You know, like Elizabeth and her aunt both, both want to talk about Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth and the, and the relationship. I mean, for this young woman, this is a very exciting thing. And for the aunt who loves her niece, it's exciting for her as well. And they don't say a word. I had some, my, my best friend in high school, his mom and dad had been married 25 years or something like that. And uh, I was tagging along with them and we went and ate pizza. And it was Jim and Ola Ross. They were very kind to me. And if any of them listen, love you guys. And they told me a story about how they had been married about 18 years. And they went to the pizza restaurant and they ordered sausage and onion like they always do. And then they found out that neither one of them liked it. And both of them thought the other liked it. And but neither of them ate a pizza that they wanted to eat for 18 years. Because nobody would say the fucking thing that needed to be said. Hey, listen, are we adults? Like, can we say, you know, I really prefer mushroom and pepperoni. How about you get half yours and I'll get pe Never. Not in 18 years. <laughs> All of Regency England, apparently, was people eating pizza they didn't want to eat because nobody thought enough of the other person to, to believe that they could bear words that reflected reality. All right, fine. But you could go too far the other way. <laughs> <laughs> fine. And at the time that this comes up, I mean, how much does one. Lizzie understand about what she actually thinks of Mr. Darcy? Because she still has the impression from the letter that he wrote. She knows that he loves her, and, but she also knows her his very harsh assessment of her family. So she never was attuned to how he actually felt. But that might explain some of the coyness here. Yeah. It's all coyness. It's all <laughs> artifice. It's all read between the lines. It's all subtext. This was written about 40 years before some of the Emerson that we've read and talked about on this podcast, where you have an American, American Yankee, Ralph Waldo Emerson, that says the thing. He doesn't want the fine person to dine with him. And he says the thing. He's distinctly American. And he's, he's honest, uh, not in order to be rude, but that he can be an individual. And this is complete, the complete opposite of this. It's abs they're like pandas. It's a it's remarkable that any of them ever got together and reproduced, <laughs> never saying what needs to be said. I'm I'm really enjoying Scott's reaction to this novel. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say uh, so. On my most recent reread, I was very annoyed by Mr. Bennett. Uh, I think he's a villain. 
with some redemption at the end, but not much because he's still going to go back to his library. The reason I think he's as bad as he is is because he's charming. He has the appearance of cleverness, the appearance of the philosopher, just like Wickham has the appearance of amiability, but he's really no good. Um, he's not actively malicious, but he's just he's just not there. He lacks fortitude. He lacks the fortitude that it would take to run interference from Mrs. Bennett. Yeah, if his family life is the way it is, well, it's the way it is because he's let it be so. He could have, I don't know, started a bridge club. He could have done something. <laughs> A whist club. There's all sorts of card mm. games n- named in here that I don't know what they are. Elizabeth annoyed me too. And everybody feels this. When you read this, you think, oh, she's your kindred, you, she's your kindred spirit. You know, that's the seduction of the novel. You read it and you think, yeah, well, I, I sit at parties and judge everybody too. But I was conscious of that and I was getting annoyed with her. But where she starts to redeem herself from this is she gets this very harsh letter from a man who loves her telling her that her family is a disaster. And her first instinct is to say, that's garbage. What a hateful thing to say. You're terrible. That would be where most of us stop. But she chews on it. She thinks about it. She starts to think, crap, he's right. In other words, reason triumphs over passion in this case. And she sees the justice of his claims on that. And and for me, that shows the greatness of Lizzie's character. You know, if somebody comes in, I, yeah. I'm going to marry you in spite of your family. And then you reject me. But really, your family is terrible. You know, what's your reaction? She is about rationality. At the end of 49, the last paragraph of 49, where she's talking about Lydia, and she's really sad for Lydia having run off with Wickham. And because she says... In looking forward, neither rational happiness nor worldly prosperity could be justly expected for her sister. You know, that rational happiness, that's what she wants. She doesn't care about Darcy's money, which is another thing he likes, because he knows she doesn't yes. care. It never comes up. She, he doesn't fawn over the sumptuousness of his dress, of the estate, even though she appreciates it very much. In fact, her aunt says that she hopes at some time to uh, take a turn about the park in a carriage which is her way of alluding to that she hopes that she gets married to Mr. Darcy. And the way she lets her aunt know that they are getting married is she says, we will, t- we will write about the park every day. She never even says we're getting married. <laughs> Ugh. The indirectness of speech is just <laughs> exasperating. But, but she's rational. She wants that. She wants that rational happiness. And she doesn't go on to define it here, but I think John could probably define it. Well, her... What's interesting is that for Lizzie, the if passion is the right word, and it might not be the right word for it, but what makes her ultimately fall in love with Darcy is a deep sense of gratitude. Uh, and there could be a cynical way of reading this. I've heard people read it cynically where it's just, yeah, once she knew he had all the money, she was really grateful for it. But that's not the way Austin presents it, because she knows the risks that Darcy took to work behind the scenes and didn't want credit for himself. He wanted to make it seem like it's the gardeners that arranged to take care of things with Wickham and Lydia, when in reality, Darcy was the one who did it. And so I think gratitude being so strong, uh, it's just an interesting thing. It's probably a little bit of the Christian side of Austin coming through too, right? Because the root of gratitude is grace. Grace is something that nobody deserves. And Lizzie doesn't feel she deserves it, especially after how she treats Darcy. Does she have gratitude for him? I mean, well, I, okay, I do. I think she does have gratitude, but we haven't said this in the podcast. His, her sister runs off as an unmarried sixteen-year-old woman to three counties away with Mister Wickham without her father's permission, etc. She is now a debased, broken right. pitcher, and has brought disgrace on the entire family. It's going to make it more difficult for her other sisters to get married. I mean, this is a big, big problem. And uh, Mr. Bennett runs away to London to try to find the daughter. Um, And then so is the uncle, Mr. Mr. Gardiner. He's trying to find the daughter as well. And unbeknownst to us until later in the book, Darcy actually finds uh, Mr. Wickham and finds out what's going on out of his own pocket. He hates Wickham, by the way. He hates him. So he has to debase himself to even speak to Wickham, 
and to, to go gutter crawling to find this POS. And then out of his own pocket, pays his debts, makes everything right with the world, secures a commission in the armed forces for him, which you have to purchase at that time, by the way, and makes it right and, and makes Wickham promise to marry him, marry Lydia, and in fact, goes to the wedding and stands there, probably with a shotgun, right, and makes sure the wedding takes place. And he hates this guy. And now it's his brother-in-law. And now that's his brother-in-law. Does he do it for Lydia? Does he do it for Wickham? Does he do it for himself? Does he do it for Elizabeth? He says he was only thinking of her. That's right. Yeah. He says he was doing it for Elizabeth. But I think for Elizabeth, she is grateful. There is no question. But it's just one more piece of evidence that he's not what she thought he was. He's not prideful. He's not nasty and grudgeful. grudgeful. He's magnanimous, grudgeful. Is that like strugglesome? Maybe. <laughs> it endeared her to her character even more. There is gratitude there. But I think the bigger thing is she's like, look at what he actually does. When the rubber yeah. meets the road, this yeah. is what he's capable of. Yeah, they're going to be fine. They're going to be the happiest people in this book. I love the gardeners. I love Mrs. Gardner. She writes these long letters, and at the end of the letter, she says, hey, the kids have been needing my attention for a half hour. I've got to go. She signs off. She writes at the end of the letter, I shall never be quite happy till I've been all around the park, a low phaeton with a nice little pair <laughs> of ponies would be the very thing. She's the good aunt that every young woman needs, you know? I like that Darcy <laughs> took the uncle fishing. Yeah, and wanted to. The whole Darcy running around in sort of lower class London, trying to find this guy and putting everything to rights and then not telling anybody and letting everybody think that it was Mr. Gardner that it did it, that's something mm -hmm. Holmes would do. He'd go in disguise, go around, find out that the man didn't run, have a, a secret family, but he was panhandling. You know, there are several stories where Holmes would do that and then not tell anybody how he fixed it and just be, just know that he had put it to right. And that was his own satis – that was the satisfaction he needed. Yeah. Carl, I loved it. It's a lot <laughs> like the Fountainhead. Except he doesn't blow up his own architecture. He's capable of it. He's that principled. Yeah. I, I love this book. I had read it last year, I think, just for fun. It's it's one of the great novels. It's a great book. There's so much funniness in here. I mean, you do have to, if you're not used to reading sentences that are 45 words long, it'll take you a little while, but you can do it. Your ancestors yeah. did it. You know, if you check the literacy rates in the early part of this country, early times in this country, when like there'd be 25 million people in the country and 23 million of them would have bought Last of the Mohicans. We had really high literacy. That's a hard book too. You know what? I should do a Carl and say, let's read that for next week. We've got seven days. Go. <laughs> we do need to read that. It's so good. Yeah, so that'll be fun because if we do that, because I'm not a huge fan of that book, and I would like somebody to take me through it and make me like it better. I love it. Look at this. This is great pod, you guys. You can't see it. There's a there's a statue at Chatsworth, the Vestal Virgin. It's in the library. It's by Raphael Monti. Uh, look at this thing. It's marble. She's probably on her, she's kneeling. She's probably three feet high. Uh, there's a little, little alcove in the library. See this tray? There's a heart on this tray. But you guys go look up the Vestal Virgin Chatsworth House. Go look at some pictures of this. It's unbelievable. Here's the flayed man. This is in their little chapel. It's a man holding a pair of shears, and he's cut his own skin off, and the skin's draped over his arm, and you can see all of his muscles and sinews. But you can see below the surface. This family bought and patronized the finest of art, I think. And uh, I think Darcy was like that. There was a true nobility and rationality in the United Kingdom at that time. This probably won't be popular. That probably drove the rise to power and global hegemony that they had. Maybe that was a good thing. Maybe that was the bad thing. But there was uh, there was a kind of rationality and wonder in the minds of these people that maybe it was a perversion, maybe not. I don't know. But but led to that. There was a a singularness of character and mind at that time that hadn't been seen. And the books sure good too. <laughs> Like in the book, Lady Catherine either. shows up before the end. She shows up. Was that too much for me like, to say, John? Elizabeth doesn't know that Darcy is interested again. 
and then Lady Catherine shows up and is trying to scare her away. And she's like, what are you trying to scare me away from? <laughs> it's just hilarious. There's so much funny stuff in this. There's a letter that Collins writes, or some words that Collins writes at the <laughs> end. It's like uh, uh, about Lydia. Uh, he's congratulating himself for not marrying into the family in a letter to the family. What a uh, douche. <laughs> you ought certainly, this is about Lydia and Wickham, you ought certainly to forgive them as a Christian, but never to admit them in your sight or allow their names to be mentioned in your hearing. <laughs> he's another one. He's an Oklahoma ass whooping later. Well, people always transpose this book into different locales. What would it be like in Oklahoma? I don't know, but the story I told about the young man and the young woman, and he's going to go like smuggle her in and uh, just hole up. You know, it, it, and th this particular family, mom and dad are there. You know, young people do things that young people do, but this is going to be a pretty wholesome thing. I know them, and uh, I'm super excited for them. You know, they're going to be in close proximity for a couple of weeks, take every meal with each other, and uh, they'll know the score, good, bad, or indifferent here in a few days. I, I think it's an Austinian you, uh, story playing hey, out there. I love it. I have one okay. more question. Are you hmm. going to read any more, Austin? If you <laughs> if you tell me. <laughs> Listen, the thing about I can't. I, I would like to, but I'm so damn busy reading everything we've got to to run this business and do this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I know. We should do something shorter for next week. The but... Mask of the Red Death. Okay. Uh, but I love uh, I love Emma. Yeah, I will read Emma. I, I, I love Clueless. Yeah. I really do. The, the aesthetic is just unbroken, super well thought out. It's just, it's a wonderful, it's just lovely to look at. It's funny. It's such a good movie. John was going to say something. Well, I mean, it kind of would derail, well, not derail, it's like three points on Austin that I wanted to add. Uh, Go. Just to, to Carl's point about the humor, uh, the shorter movie that was done maybe 10 years ago has a line from the novel in it that the longer, much better BBC version does not, which uh, has Lizzie saying, nothing will kill an early romance quicker than one bad sonnet. Uh, so you got those <laughs> nice little... Uh, witty things. The second thing I wanted to add is on the Lady Catherine visit. So like Carl, last summer I read Pride and Prejudice again for my own interest. And uh, I actually, I noticed something that was like, ripped straight out of Thucydides, uh, which people again would say I'm crazy for seeing it. But uh, this is Elizabeth, she's defending her choice. Right? Uh, that, you know, and Lizzie, Lizzie doesn't know that Darcy's going to propose to her yet. Uh, but she says, you both did as much as you could in planning the marriage. Its completion depended upon others, right? Because Lady D Lady Catherine thinks that her daughter is intended to marry Elizabeth, uh, Mr. Darcy. Uh, but Elizabeth says, if Mr. Darcy is neither by honor nor inclination confined to his cousin, why is he not here to make another choice? And if I am that choice, why may I not accept him? And Lady Catherine says, because honor, decorum, prudence, nay, interest forbid it. Yes, Miss Bennet, interest. For do not expect to be noticed by his family or friends if you willfully act against the inclinations of all. You will be censured, slighted, and despised by everyone connected with him. Your alliance will be a disgrace. Your name will never even be mentioned by any of us. So Lady Catherine uses the language of an alliance to understand how marriages should be done. Hmm. Uh, and she says, right, it's interest, honor, mm -hmm. decorum, prudence, and interest. She makes the interest case. At the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, when the Athenian envoys are in Sparta, right, and they just happen to be there by chance, but they hear Athens maligned by the Spartans, by the Corinthians. And so when the Athenians say, well, how do we come to our empire? The three motives were fear, honor, and interest. That's fear of the Persians. And then they had the empire. They held it. Then once they held it, they said our motives were honor, fear, and interest. And here is Lady Catherine talking about the honor, talking about the interest in terms of an alliance. That's what she can't abide, but she can't see it in terms of character. And I mean, it is a funny scene in a sense, because Lady Catherine is so sure of herself that she has this power to order people to do what she wants them to do. I mean, yeah. so Austin is filled with these gems to tie it to Carl's question about whether or not you'll read more Austin, uh, not to spoil the story, but Mansfield Park is the novel that I think a lot of people, they either love it or they hate it. Uh, but the last chapter of Mansfield Park is just Austin listing all the moral failings 
that led characters to become a certain way. <laughs> you just don't see stories written like this anymore. It's all about the sentiment and not about the virtue. Yeah. Yeah. She's perfect. She didn't live long enough. It is a great book. She is um, a keen observer of human nature. I, uh, a wonderful writer as long as this book is and as much dialogue there is and as many commas and semicolons and as long as the sentences are uh, there's not a spare word in it it's not romantic the only modern character is lydia it ain't a bronte book she's the one that runs off after her passions yeah. without a thought you know chases the guy through the airport she's not a good character she's a horrible person yeah and she'll pay there needs to be a sequel where we see her living in a trailer house, you know, and uh, Mr. Wickham's got like a secret family in another state. Wickham and Lydia, <laughs> Bonnie and Clyde. Oh gosh, she's too she's too lazy and dumb to even be a Bonnie. Like she's not an accomplice in anything. Anyway, there's another <laughs> my great books podcast. Listen, guys, don't eat the pizza you don't want to eat. We're all adults. Let them know what you like. You know. You don't don't eat the pizza that you don't want for eighteen years. You don't have to be a jerk. Just say, "Hey, can we make half of the pizza this one that I like this time?" What if it's pineapple? Well, you can have pineapple on your half, Carl. You can do that. We're all adults. And remember, go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash plague, and you can sign up to do a, a little free book study with us in a seminar where we talk about these books in a little uh, Socratic seminar. We're going to do it over Ender's Game but versus Scott Card. One of the Wooster and Jeeves novels. Carl has yet to pick that thing out. That'll be coming soon. And then John Pascarella will be doing one over uh, Walker Percy's essay, Loss of the Creature, which is short and uh, full of truth. Uh, I think everybody will have a great time with that. We hope to just kind of show the way, you know, show how to do this. And uh, since we're all locked in the house and uh, we at least don't have that commute time, you can use that to read and talk about this stuff on, uh, I don't know, FaceTime with your friends or read this stuff with your family and uh, maybe create a new habit. I huh? want to plug two more things. I want to plug our friend mm. John Pascarella, who is, joined us today because of his great love for Jane Austen. If you liked listening to him, and why wouldn't you? When you get a chance, you can sign up with us, and he does run seminars for us. Uh, so there's a plug for that. And we have our other podcast, the Music and Ideas podcast, with mm -hmm. uh, the formidable Michelle Hawkins, who is not at all like Lady Catherine de Burge. We talk about music and ideas. And so we're working on that, and I think it's really good, and I think it's worthwhile. So go look for that. And another plug. John has a book coming out. <laughs> he doesn't want to talk about it because he's an academic. He has a book coming out probably in the fall. What is the working title of this book? Uh, the working title of the book is Economics and the Public Good, The End of Desire. Mm. That is with the publisher right now. Have you seen the galleys? No, no. It's uh, I am editing in according with the reviewer's uh, recommendations which since the plague has set upon us and I've switched to online teaching, editing has slowed down even more than it normally would be going. So, Well, watch for that. John Pascarella, P-A-C-A-R-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. And when he gets that out, we'll be sure to read it and talk about it on this show. Thank you, guys. Yeah, go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash plague and check that out and go subscribe to uh, the Music and Ideas podcast and pass these things on. Go read an Austin book. Listen, guys, this isn't a chick book. Listen, chicks, this isn't a chick book. This is a people book. This is about <laughs> rational people trying to pursue a rational happiness and making decisions about their life and taking agency and doing things on their own behalf according to their contents of their mind. It's a wonderful book. The end. The end.